Peter. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And it is a, a, an honor to be invited here to talk to you today about the control of clinical mastitis. So let's just do a bit. Uh, I live in the southwest of England, and I spent 30 years in dairy practice there. And the southwest of England is famous for cheddar cheese. It is famous for cider. And it is famous for the Glastonbury Pop Festival. So every summer, one of our dairy farmers, you can see the cows here, he invites 200,000 people to his farm to come to a music festival for four days. He has bands like uh, the Rolling Stones, Coldplay, Ed Sheeran come to the farm. It's a very famous popular festival and most years it rains so it becomes a very muddy festival and when it gets very muddy then it can also get very dangerous so you have to be careful where you walk and then just like here you have a, a few beers and you know you are sleeping in the blue tent you just don't know which blue tent. It doesn't make any difference. It's a great way to make friends. Just like this conference, it's a wonderful opportunity to meet people. Okay, so down to mastitis. So I'm not an academic, I'm not a researcher, I'm more of a problem solver. And if we look at the changes that have happened in mastitis over the last 40, 50 years, we did see that cell counts have reduced significantly because dairy companies pay more money for low cell count milk. And what this does is it changes the epidemiology of mastitis and we see less Staph aureus and less Strep agalactia and the important bacteria that we're dealing with today are E. coli and the coliforms and Strep uberus. We know mastitis is important, it's extremely painful. All we need to do is ask any woman who's had mastitis. It involves the use of antibiotics and there's more pressure to reduce this. One of the things that I find interesting with mastitis is the effect it has on the farmer. Farmers become very depressed and very worried where they have disease problems and lots of treatments. The future is going to change and we know in lots of countries around the world getting people to milk cows is becoming more challenging. Herds are getting bigger. We now have 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 cows in dairy herds. 20 years ago we didn't have this. Many of the herds now are keeping their cows housed all year round to maximize production and feed intake. And then we have changes with technology. So we know that more people now are milking through robotic milking machines, but we also know that there are gonna be improved diagnostics and uh, other tools we can use and technology to improve how we control mastitis in the future. And this is the big area Everywhere in the world, antibiotic use in food animals is being uh, under, under scrutiny and people want less treatments. So we have to reduce all diseases. If we have a problem with a disease, we have to find out what is causing the problem. So if we break it down into simple categories, it makes it easy. So are we dealing with a contagious mastitis or an environmental mastitis or both? And when are infections entering the udder? Are they entering during lactation, during the dry period, or at both times? And what we need to do is we need to use bacteriology, bacteriology to identify what is the cause of clinical mastitis and how can we control it, but also bacteriology because that might affect our treatment decisions. And data analysis is invaluable in helping to establish what type of infections are occurring in the herd. Farms are different. We all have good farms in our practice and we have bad farms. 
This is the number of milking cow tubes per cow per year. These guys here have low levels of disease. These are going to be the people who are going to be very efficient. They're going to be in business in the future. These people here with very high levels of mastitis, they're going to struggle. And if we can show these guys that there are farmers who have low levels of disease, then hopefully they will start to reduce the amount of mastitis they have and improve. Data analysis can also point us in different directions. So data can tell us the level of disease, how many cases we have. It can tell us if it's an environmental problem, if we've got a high percentage of the herd affected. It can point to dry period infections, and it can also tell us about specific bacteria. Mastitis is a very simple disease. And we can break it down basically, E. coli and the coliforms and strep uberus account for the majority of clinical mastitis we see on dairy farms, no matter where you are in the world. If you have countries with high cell counts, then they can have still problems with Staph aureus mastitis. And you can also get uh, troublemakers like mycoplasma and other bacteria that we'll talk about a little bit later. But basically, it is, we're dealing with a small number of bacteria. This is the most important part in relation to mastitis control, the teat canal. If we keep the teat canal clean and we have a teat canal that's healthy, then what we do is we reduce the risk of infections entering the udder. And for farmers, we need to explain how mastitis occurs and the importance of the teat canal and other control measures, once they understand that, then they're going to be far more likely to adopt control mechanisms. Environmental bacteria are causing most clinical mastitis, and they get into the udder at one of three times. They can get in during milking, if treat preparation isn't good. Between milkings, if cows go and lie down on dirty beds, and then we can have dry period infections when they get in when the cow isn't lactating. So let's get on to the practical ways that we can actually manage the disease. And what we need to do is we need to know within each herd what their problem is so that we can put in specific control measures for that individual herd. Years ago, if we were talking about farmer training, people would be surprised. And now what we find is farmers, they want to be educated, they want to be trained in everything from how to carve a cow, to milking routine, to calf management. And with training, we can do a combination of classroom training, where we're explaining theory, but actually the best training is the, the training we do on farm, in the milking parlor, in the freestall barns. And what we're gonna do is, for, for herds, we're gonna put in standard operating procedures. So if you have large dairy herds with large numbers of staff, then we need to make sure that they carry out the same task every day, no matter who is doing that task. And we have herds now with maybe 10, 15, 20 employees, so we need a uniform way of doing this. We need to explain to the staff why we're doing this and, and how they're going to follow the protocol. So some examples of SOPs that we would use with dairy farmers would be, for example, how to dry off cows correctly, sterile milk sampling, um, parlor wash-up routines, all those sort of things. So what we're doing is we're increasing the skill sets and the uniformity of how things are done on farm. And then what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate to the farmer how this actually works. So teaching is one thing, but then we need to show them what they should do, and then we need them to show us that they can do it. So they demonstrate back to us. And I find that if you explain mastitis and the disease and how it's spread to farmers, then immediately they're much more interested and receptive 
in the control measures that we discussed. Okay, so a standard uh, routine for milking. Okay, environment is the key. Environmental mastitis, what do we want? We want a nice, clean environment. And if you look at this cow, she's spotless. She's lying on a clean sand free stall or cubicle. If you look at this cow when she stands up, you've seen clean udder, clean teats. The risk of mastitis from strep uberus or the coliforms in this cow is going to be very, very low. So with the environment, what we need to do is we don't, we don't listen to what the farmer says. We need to put our boots on. We need to walk into the barns and see what's happening. Clean passageways so that they're not walking dirt up into the cubicle beds, but this also helps with lameness. Scraping the backs of the beds off every time the cow goes uh, to be milked and replacing that with clean bedding because we know that the udder of the cow is going to lie along this area here. And if we keep that clean, then we reduce the risk of contamination at the end of the teat. And sand, of course, is an ideal bedding material. And whatever bedding material we use, we need to make sure that it's stored dry. There's no point putting wet bedding on. That doesn't work. We need to check the bedding that farmers are using. So this farmer was very proud. He, he was able to get hold of 20 tons of fresh sawdust. I arrived on the farm. I rolled up my sleeve. I put my hand in the sawdust, and it was extremely hot. Fresh sawdust, it was fermenting. We get a lot of Klebsiella bacteria. If we put that on the beds, we're going to get outbreaks of mastitis. So again, when we're on farms, we have to see exactly what's happening. Some farmers are going to keep their cows on straw beds or straw yards. So if you look at these cows here, what do we see? We see lots of cows. And some of these cows aren't very clean. Some of them are quite dirty. These are the cows in the first 14 days after calving. So they're under challenge from metabolic diseases. They're under challenge with immunity. And of course, in this particular herd, we were getting a significant amount of post-calving mastitis. So we need to be able to assess all of these things. And straw bedding, it's extremely comfortable, but of course, straw is related with strep uberus, and for bacteria to grow, they need heat. You can see the steam coming off this straw. They need uh, nutrients, and they need moisture. So straw bedding is a wonderful way of uh, building up strep uberus, and it can be quite difficult to manage. And again, we need to ensure that all our straw is stored dry, so it will absorb liquids when it goes on the beds. Back in, in the UK and in Ireland, lots of countries, cows are out to pasture. And when cows are at pasture, you think, wow, these cows are always going to be clean. And sometimes they can be clean if the sun is shining, but uh, sometimes they can get very dirty. So if you go to Zimbabwe, for example, in Zimbabwe they have a rainy season of four months. So this was uh, in the middle of the rainy season. It was 35 degrees. Uh, there were 120 millimeters of rain the day before. And what happens? All the cows here, they're standing in the water to try and cool off. And some of these cows, their teeth are almost touching the dirty water. Some cows lie in different places. So this cow is lighting by the feed trough. And the only thing that is stopping this cow getting mastitis is the uh, teat canal and the interdigitating folds that actually act as a barrier to stop those bacteria getting into the teat. And it just shows how effective the cow can be at preventing mastitis occurring. And this is what the milkers have to face in that herd. When you go to countries like Saudi Arabia, there's hardly any rainfall. So the, you have these exercise yards that are used at nighttime. There's only one cow there that is sunbathing. And all the cows are inside by day. So they're in their sheds. They have these lovely air conditioning units. And you think, what a perfect environment for a cow. You know, what could go wrong with mastitis there? 
And then you start walking up the shed and you realize that the water trough has been leaking. Uh, the cows find sitting in all of this really comfortable. You can see how dirty they are. And of course, you get an increase in clinical mastitis occurring. So with the environment, it is a really important factor in increasing the risk of clinical mastitis. And it's something that we have to try and manage as best we can. These other hygiene scoring cards, I think, are really useful. These uh, were developed by Pam Rug, who's going to be talking here this afternoon. Uh, she's the keynote. And it's just a very simple way of assessing how clean cows are. And then you can come back and do another assessment, maybe two or three weeks later, after changes have been made. We now move on to teat prep. This is really important, so we want farmers to milk the cows with clean teats as efficiently as possible without causing mastitis. It's an easy statement. And we want our farmers to wear clean gloves throughout milking. And the gold standard really is to do this right. We want accurate mastitis detection. And in my earlier years, I always assumed that farmers could detect mastitis correctly. Now I always question farmers about mastitis detection because many farmers over-treat cows, and some of the cows they're treating don't actually have clinical mastitis. Pre-dipping is the gold standard, so with our pre-dip, we're relying on the liquid to soften the dirt so it becomes easier to remove, and the pre-dip chemical will help to kill some of the bacteria, and when we put the pre-dip on, we allow contact time, and then we either wipe it off with paper towel or more herds are now using individual cloth towels, which are washed, disinfected, and dried before the next milking. That's what we want to put the machine onto, nice, clean, dry teats. Attach the machine within two minutes of preparation and make sure that the machine is sitting correctly on the other, so we're not getting any liner slip or squawking. And then when the cow is milked out, we apply our post-dip our post, uh, disinfectant. Ironically, in Africa, we have people doing exactly that. They're doing everything. This is a hand-milking herd. They're pre-dipping, drying. They're post-dipping. They're not wearing gloves because you can't hand-milk wearing gloves. And if they can do that in developing Africa, they can do that in any dairy herd anywhere. So what we need to do is assess teat prep. And one of the ways we can do this is we can look at the condition of these cloths. And if I look at these cloths, these are all pretty dirty. So the first concern is, what are the conditions like in the freestall barn? We could hang up the milk filters and see how clean they are after milking. And is there a difference between different milking teams or different groups of cows? We can look inside the liners during milking, look for the evidence of any fecal matter, because it shouldn't be present. We can carry out coliform counts of bulk milk, because that's a very good indication of environmental contamination. If we've got high coliform counts, the risk of mastitis is going to increase. And then if we look at tails of cows, if we've got cows, cows with long tails, then what they do is they splash dirt onto the back of the udder, onto the rear two teats. So what we need to make sure is that our farmers do their hairdressing, cut the cow's tails so they don't have long, hairy tails. And with udders, it's the same. So this farmer asked me, why was I taking this photograph? And I thought it was extraordinary he didn't get it. So there are the teats there but you can't prepare teeth properly if a cow has a hairy udder like that. So what we need to do is either clip or singe the hair off the udder so that it's easier to keep the teeth nice and clean. Dry period infections are really important and can be a big cause of mastitis in many herds. And one of the ways that we assess this is the percentage of cows with clinical mastitis in the first 30 days. So the target is 8% of cows 
can have one or more clinical cases in the first 30 days. If it's above that, it suggests there's a problem with dry period infections. The good hertz, that level might be down at 2 or 3 percent. So dry period infections we see in this herd here, for example. So these are, this is the first 30 days. This is clinical cases throughout lactation. And you can see in the first 30 days here, there is a significant amount of clinical mastitis. And when you went to this farm and looked at the condition the dry cows were in, it was easy to understand why, that was, why this was happening. We know from research that lots of cows have open teeth throughout the dry period. So this is American research. Uh, the red arrow here shows that cows, 50% of cows giving 21 liters or more at dry off had open teeth 50 days after dry off. So one in two of these cows had open teeth throughout the dry period. If you then even look at this in low yielding cows, like you'd find in New Zealand and Ireland, 20% of cows have open teeth the whole way through the dry period. We don't know which cows they are, but it's very significant. So what happens is, in the dry period, if we have an open teeth, bacteria enter the udder. They enter the udder, but unfortunately, the level of lactoferrin increases. Lactoferrin binds with iron. Bacteria need iron to multiply, so what happens is the bacteria sit in the udder throughout the dry period, and then as the cow prepares for the next calving, the lactoferrin levels drop, iron becomes available, and we can get clinical mastitis, which can occur any time in the first 100 days of lactation. And dry period infections are really significant. So this is my neighbor. My neighbor, I'm taking lots of photographs on his farm. He thinks he's a really good farmer. Uh, he's not. And you see here, these are his calving paddocks. So this animal here gave birth about two weeks ago. But look at the dirt all around here. So the risk of dry period infections in this herd is extremely high. And that is why we use internal teeth sealants. Internal teeth sealants create a physical barrier to prevent or to help prevent infections entering the udder during the dry period. That's all it's doing. It's helping to create a physical barrier. And what we see is on average a 25 to 30 percent reduction in clinical mastitis once you use internal teeth sealants. Teeth sealants is probably more research on teeth sealants than any other part of mastitis. And if we compare antibiotic dry cow therapy to teeth sealants, dry cow therapy will reduce cell count, teeth sealants reduce dry period infections, and reduces clinical mastitis in the next lactation. So they're two totally different functions. When we come on to milking equipment, Farmers love their tractors. They don't like their milking parlors. And they're reluctant to spend money on parlors, but the milking parlor is a food factory. So what we need to make sure is it's properly maintained. So we need to make sure that we have minimal teeth damage, because teeth damage is going to allow bacteria entry into the udder. The liners need to be changed at the correct frequency so that we're not uh, slowing down milking or the liners aren't acting as a vector of spread of infection. We don't want liner slip. And the machine has to be properly maintained, not only to prevent mastitis, but also to milk the cows efficiently. It's really important. And as veterinarians, we don't sell milking equipment, but it can be quite useful if we go in and carry some simple tests to check how well the parlor is actually working. No matter how well we milk cows, we're going to always end up with some clinical mastitis. That's just going to happen. Ideally, what we're going to do is we're going to milk the infected cows last. And by milking them last, we reduce the risk of cross-contamination. But we also help to reduce the risk of residues entering the bulk tank. In very big herds, then what you often find is there's a separate parlor that is just used 
for milking mastitis cows or any other cows under treatment. And the advantage of either having a separate parlor or milking last is it gives you the time to do the job properly. Time to assess the cow properly and make sure that when you're administering the treatments, you're doing it in the correct way. We should be collecting samples, milk samples, sterile milk samples from every clinical case to build up a picture of what bacteria are present in the herd so we can make sure our control measures are good. We should follow an SOP for treatment. So no matter who is milking, they can follow the SOP and this will be updated according to what we find. Disinfect the end of the teeth with cotton wool soaked in alcohol so that when we come to administer the intramammary tube, we're not introducing bacteria on the end of the tube. Some farmers don't disinfect and they introduce bacteria into the udder and that can be a disaster. And then if we're milking cows with the main herd, then we should ideally have a separate mastitis cluster or alternatively, if we can't have that, then you disinfect the cluster before it's used to milk another cow. We're seeing more and more farms moving to robotic milking. This is a lifestyle choice for farmers. What they're doing is getting away from twice a day milking. It's becoming a more pleasant way to milk their dairy cows. And if you look at this picture, what do we see? The first thing we see is lots of space. We see incredibly clean cows. And with robotic herds, what we want is these have to be managed in a totally different way to a conventional herd. If you look at this image, so this was from a robotic farm that was built around about 2005. And what you see is lots of cows overcrowding. They're dirty. Problems with mastitis were much, much higher. The robot has a set routine. It cannot differentiate between a clean and a dirty cow. So what it does is it just follows one routine for cleaning. So what we need to do is make sure when the cows come in, they are as clean as possible. This is the big challenge. The farmer buys the technology. He buys this robot. He maybe spends $100,000, $200,000 on two robots. The robot tells him there's a case of clinical mastitis. How does he interpret that? Is it true or is it not true? And so the understanding of the technology and what you do if you get error messages for any problem on the robot is really, really important. And with robotic herds, initially I find lots of farmers are carrying out too many treatments of clinical cases, cases that actually are perfectly okay. There are various standards that we want for robotic milking. Uh, the key ones will be this stocking density that makes sure the cows are kept clean. And cow flow is critical to make sure that cows can visit the udder, or so visit the robot as frequently as they choose to do so. And I think this is really clever. This is one of our farmers, and he has built his own cow crush and steps down so that he can carry out treatments properly and safely to cows in the robot. And I thought that's actually really good. That should be on every robotic unit. So simple. When we come to nutrition and feeding, it's really important because if we get cows and they have diarrhea, then what happens here is this loose manure is going to splash everywhere. It's going to splash on the legs of the cow. It's going to splash on the beds which means that when other cows go and lie down, then the risk of them having dirty teats and more clinical mastitis is going to be higher. So just even fecal consistency is really important. We know that when cows get hypocalcemia or milk fever, the incidence of clinical mastitis increases. So this is some trial work that was carried out by uh, Fraser Menzies in Northern Ireland and he found that the level of clinical mastitis increases very significantly with milk fever. So again, we need to prevent metabolic diseases. 
This is uh, trial work carried out by Ken Leslie in Canada on ketosis. And what he's found is in the first two weeks after calving, 10 cows that were healthy had clinical cases, but the cows with ketosis had 50% more cases. So they had 15 cases compared to 10. But this isn't really a surprise, but it just means that what we need to do is make sure that we monitor metabolic diseases and ketone bodies and take whatever corrective action is necessary. Vaccination. We have vaccines against uh, E. coli. So in America, we have the J5 vaccine. And what the J5 vaccine does is it reduces the severity of mastitis and it reduces the number of cows that die with E. coli mastitis. So it's very effective. In the US, it's a, it's a fairly cheap vaccine, so it's widely used. In Europe, we just have a, a strep uberus vaccine has been launched in the last three months, and it's just starting to come onto the market. And the vaccine claims a reduction in strep uberus clinical mastitis by 50% which is a big impact in terms of reducing the number of treatments and uh, ensuring the cows continue to produce well. The last thing we want is for our heifers to have mastitis because we know if a heifer gets clinical mastitis, then the culling rates increase and also her production for her lifetime decreases. And we want heifers to have low levels of clinical mastitis. And generally, they do. And the NMC, the National Mastitis Council, uh, which is a global organization for mastitis control, has set out a really nice 10-point plan to help prevent clinical mastitis in heifers. And if you're not a member of the NMC, it's an organization that is well worth joining. There are still some countries that have problems with Staph aureus. So when I go and do work in Africa, Staph aureus is really common because there's no control of cell counts and we get a lot of gangrenous mastitis. And Staph aureus has been controlled by the five-point plan. So that is antibiotic dry cow therapy, looking after the milking machine, good hygiene, all the basic control measures. And with Staph aureus, we have to identify the troublemakers, so we might use individual cow cell counts, or if that isn't available, then what we might do is we rely on the CMT test, and then what we're gonna do is put in simple control measures. So these are the basic hygiene measures we would follow. Wearing gloves, really important. Culling out the problem cows, very important. Post-milking teat disinfection changing the liners at the correct frequency, milking the infected cows last. So it should be straightforward to control Staph aureus mastitis. Where it becomes difficult is in small herds with maybe four or five cows. If you have two infected cows and you want to cull those two and the farmer's left with three, then that becomes really challenging. Mycoplasma mastitis is uh, it's a, it's a really horrible organism. It's an anaerobe, so we don't find it commonly with bacteriology. We have to request uh, culturing. It takes about seven days, and the anaerobes, the bacteria, look like fried eggs. Or we could use PCR technology. And in the U.S., the incidence of mycoplasma is increasing. Part of this is because herds are buying in lots of new cows. Some of them might be infected. One of the easy ways that we can screen for mycoplasma is from bulk tank sampling. So in the big dairy areas, every month samples will be taken and they'll culture for mycoplasma, Prototheca, Staph aureus, Strep uber, Strep ag, all these organisms. It's a really good thing to do. And then what we need to do is if we have mycoplasma in the herd, we need to identify which cows are infected and then we put them into a quarantine group and always milk them at the end. Most, a lot of mycoplasma cows are culled because they don't respond to any treatment, but some of these cows do undergo self-cure. So if they're repeat, if you bacteriology carried out repeatedly, then 
you might be able to identify some of these cows actually have recovered and they can go back in with the herd. It is actually quite a difficult bacteria organism to manage and the control measures will vary from herd to herd and what resources are available. So, in summary, mastitis is a multifactorial disease. Well, we all know that. It's actually also a very simple disease, fortunately. Once we can break down the diagnosis and we know that we're dealing with environmental or contagious, dry period or lactation period infections, and then the organism, then what we can do is we can put in the most appropriate control measures, and we're likely to go back and change these and refine these if things get better or if things go wrong. And I think there's little doubt that in the future there's going to be more pressure on the use of antibiotics in food producing animals and we're going to see a big reduction uh, in mastitis because of consumer pressure and pressure from milk buyers. We all have farmers with dairy herds with low levels of disease. They're the guys, they're, they're the guys it's really easy to work with. The people that are the challenge are the people with high levels of disease, no matter what it is, who are very reluctant to change. Uh, so, that is my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank you for staying awake. Uh, if you have any questions, then